Welcome to the second episode in a two-part series about the life of John D. Queen Elizabeth's magician. In part two, we will talk about the later years of John D. and how they were marred by controversy and failure. During his first five decades of life, John Dee became a Star University student, built a vast library, personally advised on voyages of discovery, and became an astrologer to two queens. In 1578, Dee married at the age of 51 to Jane Fromond, then only 23 years old. Prior to their marriage, Jane served as lady-in-waiting to the Countess of Lincoln, and Jane's connections at court helped her new husband to secure patronage during his later years. Together, John and Jane had eight children, four boys and four girls. Of course, Dee kept his magical scientific studies going. In 1582, Dee recommended that England adopt the Gregorian calendar, but the Anglican Church refused something that it regarded as a Catholic invention. England continued to use the Julian calendar, though Dee's own calculations marked it as being off. Indeed, the Julian calendar put New Year's Day on March 25th, and the Gregorian would not be adopted until 250 years after Dee's death. By the 1580s, John Dee became disillusioned with life at court. He never really attained the success that he'd hoped for, and came to regard himself as a failure. As a result, he turned away from politics and delved into the realm of the supernatural, devoting much effort to communicating with angels. Dee hoped that the intervention of a scryer would put him in touch with angels who could then help him gain unfound knowledge to benefit all mankind. After going through several professional scryers, Dee met Edward Kelly, a well-known occultist and medium. Kelly lived in England under an assumed name because he fled the continent after being charged with forgery. Indeed, Kelly had to wear a black skull cap for authorities on the continent cut off his ears as punishment for his crimes. However, that didn't dissuade Dee, who became impressed by Kelly's supposed abilities. The two men worked together, holding spiritual conferences which included prayer, ritual fasting, and supposed communication with angels. Dee hoped to find a single mathematical magical symbol to unlock the unity of all natural sciences, something he explored in his 1564 book Manos Hieroglyphica. Kelly and Dee held seances in England, Poland, and Bohemia. The angels supposedly advised Dee in spiritual matters and showed him secret knowledge. Kelly and Dee even created Anakian, a spoken and written language with which he claimed he communicated with angels. Dee even claimed that Anakian angels dictated many of his books directly to him. Though Dee claimed Anakian to be the basis for ancient Semitic languages, it used an alphabet of 21 letters almost certainly modeled on English. Yet neither angels nor Anakian helped Dee achieve his ultimate goal of reunifying the Catholic and Protestant churches through a single mathematical magical symbol. That may have been in part because Kelly duped a gullible Dee into believing he had greater powers than he possessed. Most likely, Kelly used ventriloquism to convince dupes, including Dee, that he had supernatural powers. Late in their partnership, Kelly informed Dee that the angel Uriel instructed them to share everything, including wives. Of note, Kelly was three decades younger than Dee and much closer in age to Jane Fromond than her own husband. Nine months after the two men parted ways, Jane gave birth to a son, and many suspected him to be Kelly's child. When Dee finally returned to England, he learned that jealous book lovers had snatched nearly half his library of 4,000 books. Today, only 100 of his books remain in a unified collection after the looters did their job. 
Because of his meddling in occultism, Dee's reputation in the English scientific community plummeted, and he became known as a conjurer. His former partner Kelly fared far worse. Earlier in life, he promised, and failed, to make iron into gold for Prince Rudolf II, a German notable. Arrested for fraud in Germany, Kelly died while trying to escape from a German prison. On the other hand, Dee's friends came to his aid and raised money for him. Dee petitioned Queen Elizabeth for a role in her court, while he hoped that she would allow him to use alchemy to reduce England's national debt, she instead appointed him Warden of Christ's College in Manchester. Unfortunately, it was a Protestant institution, and Dee's dabbling in alchemy and the occult did not endear him to the faculty there. They viewed him as unstable at best and hellbound at worst. During his tenure, several priests consulted Dee about demonic possession of children, a concern that grew out of his occult studies. According to legend, Dee also used his magic power to hex the Spanish Armada with numerous storms. Of course, it remains uncertain if his charms had any real effect on the weather. Later in life, his wife Jane Dee became involved in his studies of women's health. Sadly, most of the 8D children died during their teenage years, at least three perishing with their mother Jane in a wave of bubonic plague that swept through Manchester in 1605. Arthur, the eldest surviving son of John Dee, followed in his father's footsteps and became personal physician to King Charles I. Sadly, poverty and isolation marred Dee's final years. Disavowed by his former friends among the English ruling class, Dee had to sell off his books and instruments to make ends meet. He likely died at Mortlake in December 1608, a property he inherited through his father. Today, it is almost certain that William Shakespeare modeled the character of Prospero in The Tempest upon John Dee. Magic and metaphysics tied in with science during the Elizabethan era, so Dee's work is a chronicle not just of his life and work, but that of Tudor England and its intellectual life. Although he may not have been taken seriously by many during his lifetime, Dee's collection of books show him as a man dedicated to learning and knowledge. More importantly, his vast understanding of geography helped to expand England's presence in the world during the age of Sir Francis Drake and Walter Raleigh. That wraps things up for this episode of The Legendarium. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, press like. If you want to see more, press subscribe. And if you've got anything to say, let me know in the comments section. Thanks again for joining me, and I hope that you have a great rest of the day.